So we've seen type 1 and type 2 errors and how potent and powerful they can be for a real life situation. So we want to determine based on our little null and alternative hypotheses whether we can figure out whether a type 1 or type 2 error would be made or a correct decision based on the context of the problem. For this, it'll be really, really helpful to actually have that little table available to us. I might be having to flip back and forth to get it to show up though. Okay, so a test is made of sigma equals 0 0.5 versus sigma is greater than 0 0.5. Now the true value of sigma is 0.6. Oh, so there's a, there's a key. The true value, so that's reality. So see reality? Reality is that sigma is 0.6. Well, 0.6 is greater than 0.5. So reality is that H1 is true, which means I'm over on this side of the house, right? I'm looking at this column because in reality, H1, the alternative is true. It really is greater than 0.5. All right, but if H0 was rejected, okay, so I'm sitting here. I either I'm going to make a type 2 error or a correct decision. So H1 was true, and I decided to reject H0. So if I reject H0 and H1 was true, then I made a correct decision. All right, now what about the next one? Okay, so the true value is of mu is 454. And you can see H0 is that mu is 454, and H1 is that mu is not equal to 454. So the null and alternative hypotheses. So if the true value really is 454, then that means that H0 is true. So I'm over on the left-hand column. right? H0 is really true, mu is really 454. If I reject that H0, right? So H0 is true, and I reject it, then I'm making a type 1 error. All right, last one. Let's see if I can squeeze it in there. All right, so my H0 is that P is 20%. My H1 is that P is less than 20%. Ah, if P is really 0.17, that's the population proportion. If it's really 0 0.17, 0 0.17 is less than 20%. So that means that H1 is true, which means I'm over on the right-hand side of the column again. If H1 is really true, but then I do not reject H0, I let H0 stand, but H1 is the one that's true, I've made a type 2 error. So that's a type 2 error. We tend to go with Latin letters on those. So type 1, type 2, it tends not to be the numbers. Although it's not the end of the world if you write the numbers. All right, so obviously these are important things, right? Type one and type two errors are not good. We don't want to make them. And so therefore they have a whole host of definitions unto themselves. Starting off with the most important part, which is that the type one error rate is what alpha is. Remember alpha? Alpha, that little subscript when we were doing our um, confidence intervals, Z alpha over two, T alpha over two, alpha is the probability of making a type one error. And you really cannot star this page enough, <laughs> right? This box, very important. So give it some stars, highlight it. It's a big deal, right? So the type one error rate is alpha. It's so important, it has its own definition called the level of significance. So alpha is the level of significance. They are one and the same. And alpha will be given to you in every problem. It is a Greek letter, by the way. It looks like a fish, right? And it's alpha. It is the probability of rejecting H0 when it was true. It's the probability of that type 1 error. Now, the type 2 error, we're not going to work with so much, um, but we are going to talk about it a little bit. It's beta. It's the letter B in the Greek alphabet system. So that's letter A in Greek alphabet. This is letter B in Greek alphabet. So it's beta, and it's the probability of a type 2 error. And it's the probability of not rejecting H0 when it was false. Now, beta is a really big deal in its own right. It's more difficult to work with, however, so we're not going to deal with it much in this class. But suffice it to say that alpha and beta are related to each other. And there's one other thing, if you've ever heard of the power of a test, which you may hear about in uh, later courses, they'll talk about the power of a test. So that's one minus beta. It's the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is true.
If you're interested in that, you can look up uh, section 10.6 in the online textbook and find out about that. Um, you will actually hear that in medical terms. They'll say the power of this flu test, right, is blah, 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 right? So they'll talk about that. And it does have important context. All right, now here's the thing. Why can we not just make these zero, right? So, I mean, if, if this type one error, for example, if this is so bad, then why don't we just set this to be zero? Right, well, let's think about that. If you wanna make it so you're never, 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 never gonna wrongfully convict anybody, then you're actually just gonna be afraid of convicting in general, which means you're gonna be boosting this one over here, right? Because all these people that would have been convicted will end up going free. Because if you're so afraid of doing false convictions, you're never gonna do the guilty verdict and you're gonna end up in here a lot. And vice versa, if you're afraid of this, which many would argue is where the U.S. society is, is more at, as we have the highest incarceration rates in the world. So we're so afraid of letting anybody go that could possibly be guilty that we end up convicting a lot more. We end up down here in the guilty zone a lot more, which means we've boosted this. So in the U.S., this is a lot higher, perhaps, than it would be in another country because we are so afraid of letting this type 2 error happen that we cause type 1 to happen more often. So if you will, there's an inverse relationship between alpha and beta. I'm going to make a little teeter-totter, right? So if I have alpha over here and beta over here, if I try to lower my beta, right, because I never, never, never want to let a, a guilty person walk free, then automatically I'm raising my alpha. Right. And then by the same token, if you're going the other way and saying, no, 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 we can never put down behind bars somebody that didn't do it, then you're going to be raising your beta. There's a relationship going on between the two. All right. So there's an inverse relationship. That's what that is. We've seen that before. Right. An inverse relation between alpha and beta. When one goes up, the other goes down. All right, and so the other reason you cannot just set alpha and beta to zero, right, which would be, you know, in theory, oh, that'd be great. Why can't we just make it so we never do anything wrong? Well, you can't because you don't know the whole situation, right? You're, you're never 100% sure of anything. So if you let alpha equal zero or beta equal zero, well, first of all, if alpha was equal to zero, your beta would be huge and vice versa because they're on a teeter-totter together. But also it would imply that you're, 100% certain, which is impossible. We cannot be 100% certain of anything, right? Because we're not omniscient. We only know what we have evidence for, but that's it, right? We cannot prove things one way or another. We can't accept things one way or another. 100% certainty is where the words prove and accept come from. So that's why on the previous page or two pages ago, it said, you know, we never write prove. We never write accept, right? Because acceptance implies that you're 100% certain and we cannot be 100% certain. Sorry. So that's why we can never say those words. It's impossible to be 100% certain. So therefore, we can never set alpha or beta to zero. And even if we tried, we'd cause the other one to go way up. So if I try to lower my alpha really, really low, my beta level is going to go through the roof. All right, one more bit of information about these two. So Charlie is going to perform a hypothesis test at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level of significance, which is a bit of a redundancy because once you see it's alpha, then it automatically is level of significance. They mean the same thing. Then Felice will perform the same test at alpha equals 0 0.01 level of significance. Now, if H0 is true, who has the greater probability of making a type 1 error? Hmm. Okay, we'll go back up and look at right here. The probability of a type 1 error is alpha by definition. So the answer to this is Charlie, because his probability of a type 1 error is alpha, which is 0 0.05, is higher for him. Right, Felice was only 0 0.01, higher than Felice at 0 0.01. Right. So he's going to have the greater chance of making a type 1 error. So he's more likely to do that type 1 error. But then, who has the greater chance of making the type 2 error? 
Mm. That would be Felice, right? It's a little bit of a indirect relationship, right? So Felice has the lower probability of making a type one, right? Her type one error probability is only 0 0.01. That's her alpha. So that means that she has a higher probability of a type two error, which would be her beta. We don't know what it is, but we do know that it's higher because alpha and beta are on a teeter totter together. So he has the higher alpha, so he's going to have the lower beta. She has the lower alpha, so that she's going to have the higher beta, right? So she has a lower alpha, higher beta. She's going to have the greater probability of making a type two error. So he's more likely to do a type one error. She's more likely to do a type two error. Alpha and beta are on a teeter totter together. They have an inverse relationship.